Welcome to the Martin E. Siegel Theatre Centre here at the Graduate Centre CUNY and to Prelude 21, uh, Start Making Sense. Um, it is our annual um, theatre and performance festival celebrating the work of New York theatre artists and ensembles and it's hard enough in normal times to create work for the stage and for uh, spaces inside and outside but in the time of Corona we all are faced with exceptional challenges and uh, we are here to celebrate again the extraordinary achievements that come out of the New York theatre community. It is time, I think, and we feel to start making sense to ask uh, questions. Why are we making theatre? But also how are we producing it? And for whom? And uh, this is a great investigation again into the um, mechanics uh, of making art uh, in New York City and we also invited uh, theater ensembles from around the US from Detroit and Cincinnati, St. Louis and uh, Philadelphia, uh, New Orleans um, to join us and um, this will be an extraordinary look into uh, what is on the minds of artists right now. We also have uh, many panel discussions. Uh, we have uh, an award which we are giving out uh, to honor uh, uh, outstanding members of the New York theater community, so I would like to all of you to uh, join in and uh, get an insight of what uh, is happening. Welcome, uh, everybody, back here uh, at Prelude at the Martin E. Siegel Theatre Center at the Graduate Center CUNY in Midtown Manhattan. It's a great day on planet Earth because it's day three um, of uh, Prelude, and we have with us curators um, and artists from one of our chains, like Chain 3. Um, we created something new, we experimented and had the idea of chain creation, and actually Jay Wagman was the one who, who said that would be something to do. And he here is with us. And uh, let's ask one curator to create one artist. And then the curator selects another curator. So we distribute power that we invite. Uh, we leave in the sense of a John Cage, uh, a possibility for chance out there. And, um, and I think it proved to be extraordinary interesting. So really, in the sense, by its by, the, by, by perhaps by default as a diverse crowd of artists and curators. And I think it's a fantastic, beautiful and inspiring mosaic um, or kaleidoscope of uh, New York work. Of course, there are many, many other great artists, but this is not who we have. This is where curators thought we should listen to these artists and we should listen also to the suggestions of these curators. So I think it's a fantastic um, uh, 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 a little festival, a tiny one, a little homeopathic pill into the gigantic body of that big theater we are um, all faced with. That great German writer, Peter Sonde, he wrote about theater, said theater is like uh, Heracles uh, who is chained on a rock and the eagles are coming and eating out the liver and it's uh, or prometheus here they are changed and uh, heracles came to 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 um, liberate him and a theater has to get out it has to take away the the chains in the veins that the, the out of that uh, rock and become free again and i think this is a little attempt to um um, to do that. So we have with us Jesse today, Jay, Isaac, Alessandra, Lumi, uh, Sybil, and Alex. It's a great honor to have you with us, that you take your time, your energy um, to be with us, uh, to share your experiences in this truly complicated time. And it's a, a great honor. It's all about listening. And I hope I will shut up and not talk uh, uh, too much. First, I do want to um, acknowledge um, the land we are on. It's important to us. We actually have a panel on indigenous New York theater today at 4.30. Ryan Opalanietat, uh, one of our graduate students, he also will um, will um, lead the panel. But I would like to acknowledge the Lenape people upon whose land we are gathered today. And yes, also the airwaves um, that are coming out of here. And we do pay respect to the Lenape people and ancestors past, present, and future. So uh, that is important to us. 
So um, I'm going to ask everybody to say where they are and uh, give it a little uh, short introduction. Not everybody knows everybody. I'm often uh, uh, finding out of a work of artists I haven't heard of, and at least we take pride of looking at the scene, and we do not know. And so this is a great, a great way to discover. So Jesse, maybe we'll start with you, or we go clockwise on the Zoom screen. Sure. Um, hey, everybody. My name is Jesse Firestone. Uh, I'm an interdisciplinary curator. I've worked um, in a range of institutions from like really grody DIY spaces to sort of new, cleaner, um, large civic institutions. Uh, and right now I work on the curatorial team at a cultural center and garden in the Bronx called Wave Hill. Um, I'm having a bit of that moment in Wayne's world where they meet Alice Cooper and they're like, we're not worthy. We're not worthy because this panel is really amazing. Um, and I'm just so, so glad to be here. Fantastic, thank you. Isaac, uh, can they say a little bit? Yeah, um, I'm Isaac Cole. I'm an interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary artist, often um, trying on new disciplines uh, to kind of like follow fun problems that are there. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I'll echo Jesse with, with everyone today. Um, yeah, I'm in, I'm in Brooklyn, the Napa Hoking land, uh, yeah. Fantastic, thank you, thank you. Alessandra. Hi everyone, it's so great to be holding space with you all. I'm very excited to be on this panel. Alessandra Gomez, um, I am calling in from Brooklyn on Lenape land. Um, I'm a writer and also an interdisciplinary curator with a focus on commissioning new work. I currently work at The Shed, which is a fairly new arts institution that opened in April of 2019. We weren't even open a year before the pandemic and shutdowns happened. Um, but our focus is really on commissioning and producing, presenting a wide range of work from visual arts to music to dance and sort of everything in between. So I work on the visual arts team, but also work across performance on a lot of live projects in our other theatrical spaces. Thank you, thank you. Louis. Hi everyone, um, I'm Lumi Tan. Very excited to be here with all of you. Um, I am a senior curator at The Kitchen where I am currently. Um, so you might hear some doorbells ringing or some soundtracks for Alex's performances later tonight. Um, but I uh, curate both exhibitions and performances of all types um, with I don't know if I have a focus actually, but I do. I do a lot of commissioning, um, as well as you know, kind of straddling that curator producer uh, role. So um, excited to talk with all of you. Thank you. And Alex, uh, they will perform tonight. We will see it. You know, at uh, seven p.m. If you go to our Prelude NYC.org site. So Alex. Hi everyone. I'm Alex Tatarski. It's so fun to be here. Um, I'm backstage at the kitchen at the moment, so feeling um, a lot of the pre delightful pre-show panic, which is the reason that we all do what we do. So just soaking up those um, adrenaline vibes and um, and yeah, excited to dive into what everyone is thinking about and feeling in this very peculiar moment. Um, yeah, I'm in residence here at the kitchen, and um, this this will be my first kind of peek into the process. So it's nice that it coincides with um, Prelude. Yeah, so created uh, for Prelude. Mm -hmm. Frank, what are we going to do if we lose Frank? <laughs> I mean, he looks great. <laughs> He's frozen in a good moment, but yes. <laughs> frozen nonetheless. Frank, I think I was maybe next. Should I just go and then hopefully he'll come back? Okay, um, it is a great honor. Wait, wait, wait one there second. Frank, we yeah. lost you. If you can hear me, say, say hello. It's your sound is a little, yeah. Frank, we can't hear you that well. Okay. So let's wait a moment. Okay, and you're still frozen. Yeah. This is so intense. Okay, thank you, Tanvi. My name is Sybil Kempson. 
Uh, I'm so excited to be here with you all. Um, some of you I know and some of you are new to me and I'm really excited to talk with you. I'm, um, I'm uh, stream yarding in from Newburgh, New York in the, um, the Hudson River Valley. It's Montse Lenape territory and also Mohican territory. And I'm originally from uh, Lene Lenape territory in Northern New Jersey. And I lived in, in also in Brooklyn and Queens and Manhattan for many years. Um, so almost my whole life I've been on Lenape territory and it's a, it's a wonderful part. It's wonderful um, land. So um, I'm very happy to be alive and to be here with you all and to have a talk today. And I guess I'll go, right? Uh, Jay Wegman, I am the director of the NYU Skirball Center for the Performing Arts. I am stream yarding in live from my office at NYU. Uh, normally I would have a mask on, but my door is shut. So um, my staff is safe from me. Um, I have been doing this role for about five years. Before that, I uh, was at Abrams for about 10 years. And uh, I I guess I'm a curator. I, um, Mark Russell, who many of us knows, he's, he says he's not a curator, he's a presenter or a programmer. And I'm like, well, I'll, I'll honor any of those. So, uh, but I, I like to work across uh, theater, dance and any of those combinations or even the new whacked out stuff like uh, like Sybil's doing. So uh, that's me. Um, Sybil, since we're still waiting for Frank, why don't you talk yeah. about your show? Oh, I thought you wanted me to do some of my impressions. Oh, um, do that, do whatever you want. Um, <laughs> Okay, well, uh, I, I am on, um, so I, there's a, a, okay, I should say that I'm mostly a playwright, and then I started out as a performer, and I felt dissatisfied, so I, I started writing plays, and then my plays were maybe a little too crazy, and uh, they were, I was having trouble getting any, convincing anybody to do them, and then when I did convince them, uh, I had trouble behaving myself in the rehearsal room. I was becoming a control freak. And so I came to the conclusion I need to start my own company, even though, um, oh, okay. Maybe should we, okay, I'll just finish real quick. So the piece that I'm doing is, um, it's called the Securely Conferred Vouchsafed Keepsakes of Mary S. And it's uh, uh, the second part of a diptych and the first, of that diptych was Sasquatch Rituals, which Lumi uh, brought to the kitchen in 2018, which was a fantastic uh, experience. And um, and now uh, the the second part of it is it's a play, and it was supposed to happen at Abrams in the Playhouse, and then the pandemic came, and then so I. It ended up, it's like a video now, but it's it's almost like, um, it's photogra pho photography too. So um, I don't know how to explain it. I don't know what it is really yet. So um, hopefully showing a little piece of it here uh, uh, at Prelude will, maybe y'all could give me some feedback when you see it, but it's, it's gonna screen at uh, the Chocolate Factory who commissioned it on Halloween, Sunday night, and then it will stream from Abrams, um, who, who is also co-commissioned it, um, from November 4th to December 22nd. And um, it's actually the first half of it because it was uh, time consuming and I, I wasn't, I didn't manage to finish the whole thing. Uh, so I'll, I'll show the rest of it next year. So that's, yeah, thank you, Jay. So yeah, now Tanvi says she wants the curators to speak. Yes. Very good. So I'm back. I don't know if you, I couldn't see you, but maybe you were on all time and it was just me. We lost. I think Jay did. I don't know if he went um, to you. I wanted to ask you also, you know, a bit of, speak a little bit about the chain curation and tell also a little bit about you. Uh, 
Sure. Well, I, I did talk a little bit about me, but this, I just need to say that do you remember an awful movie called Airport 1975? And Karen Black was a stewardess on it, and somehow the pilot disappeared, so she had to take over the plane. So I kind of felt when you got frozen and then you left, I was like, oh my God, we're no. It's Airport 75 all over again. Oh, good, good. I thought everybody got lost, but that's good. It was just me. Good. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, so the chain curation idea. Uh, I don't know when I first heard about chain curation, uh, but I love it. It's uh, it's a wonderful way to share uh, power, uh, to, um, to also... Uh, encounter things that people would like you had alluded to that earlier uh because of the way the the festival unfolded this year you're going to experience things that you typically wouldn't have i mean that's certainly true for me um so i just you know i i've been toying with the idea of doing that at skirball uh skirball is always um oh we're so embedded in a university that we're not all that independent. So, uh, and like, we still aren't even back in the theater yet, quite honestly. Um, but, uh, so the chain curation thing is something I'd like to try here down the road. Um, it's risky, but the risk is the exciting part, I think. Um, so uh, that's really all I have to say about that. Mm. Yeah, no, right. really, thank you. It was um, and great to get, you know, that push also from you to do it and to, and we have asked artists to take risks and curious everybody, but also we as presenters in the way that we are, we should do it. I would like to ask all of you and we can go around, you know, how, how is this moment? How are you experiencing this moment, which is in Germany, we say it's not nicht fish, nicht fleisch. it's not fish, it's not meat, it's something in between. How do you all feel and how do you make sense? Out of your work, maybe it was Isaac. Uh, they start. Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting because the project that I'm sharing was started before the pandemic, but it was already all about isolation um, and sort of about this like uh, very private, like individual world of dreaming. Um, so when the pandemic happened, it sort of really deepened those questions and, and those thoughts. Um, and I was actually really fortunate to uh, get more opportunities during the pandemic. I had a few residencies, so I was working uh, pretty intensely, but without any collaborators, without performers to talk with. So I kind of turned the project into a sculptural project for a few months um, and started doing a lot of researching and writing and uh, working on the soundtrack. So I kind of had to morph the way that I was working and thinking for a while and made a lot of discoveries along the way. And it was actually like a really rich experience, which I know is probably irresponsible for me to say. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think that the pandemic made me realize also that it's really important to take time um, to work more slowly and to sort of push for that wherever possible um, and to kind of, uh, embrace the idea of taking longer than you might think you need and trying to push up against the pressure to to overproduce, I think. Um, so in many ways, it was a really, really powerful learning moment for me. Hmm. Anybody just chime in? Um, Alex, maybe. Yeah. I feel like I learned so much from the experience of not having to work and getting money from the government. And that changed my entire practice and relationship to labor in a way that I'm still processing. And also like witnessing and participating in uprisings and revolt and the possibility of community mutual aid and rent strikes um, in this way that I think for a lot of us, we like didn't feel that we had time and energy to do. And that was really striking to me, like, oh, when you are better rested and you're eating several times a day and you don't have an anxiety about where the next paycheck is coming from, you discover what you care about, which in my case is like soil science and 
organizing <laughs> redistribution of resources, <laughs> which like was this total discovery, actually, I must say, because I never in my life had experienced this, um, yeah, a sense of actually amidst crisis kind of st financial stability for the first time. So I'm just thinking about that so much. And I have this real um, bunch of like ugly feelings that come up when I revisit work made in the before times because it comes out of such a feeling of intense stress and overwhelm. So part of the time at the kitchen, which is called untitled freak out, tell me what to do is like, how can we rethink our relationship to work, but like actually genuinely do that? And can that happen within the structures that we have? Um, and I'm finding like a lot of resistance in myself to even attempting what I said I was gonna attempt, which is try to work differently. So um, it's really fascinating. And then of course, like all these images and things are coming up out of that, like unemployed court jesters. And so I'm just like following the, the impulses with these questions in mind um, and like totally what Isaac, what you said really resonates, like letting things take a really long time and trying to not have this like shame around lack of product really makes me aware, like the extent to which the way we make theater is really product oriented. Um, and what does that mean? Just to be like always thinking about selling a finished thing and what does that not allow to happen? So yeah, I'm very excited and like, freaked out by these questions and whether or not it's possible to make like substantive changes in myself and how we do things structurally. Yeah, it's as like someone said, there will be BC and AC, like before Corona and after uh, Corona. Sybil, you were on a long Siegel talk, but still, what are your thoughts at the moment? How do you feel? All right, I'm gonna try not to start crying on this one, that in the Siegel yeah. talk, I was telling Jay, I just, I was so, embarrassed I just started crying I was talking about love and I just couldn't keep it together well, we're um, serious. It was serious and profound yeah. thanks Frank um so uh I'm absolutely relating 100 percent um for me it was it was about um uh having enough solitude for the first time since childhood I um I have a younger half brother and half sister and um they're way younger, so by the, yeah, I, I, I have the mentality of an only child. And when you're working in theater, it's very communal and community oriented. And, um, and, and I found this way of working that I didn't know what I was doing. And, uh, but I had time and space to figure it out. And I, I really made a point of observing that thing of, um, oh my God, how am I going to finish this on time? And we, we had to keep pushing the deadline back because I was basically ended up doing like almost animation kind of, and it, and I didn't know what I was doing. I was really excited about it, but it just was so time consuming. And I was all by myself figuring out these kind of like staging problems, not all by myself. There were a bunch of us working on it, but when it came down to putting it together, um, I, I, there was a lot of figuring out. I was just working on iMovie, which I don't even know really what I'm doing on iMovie. Um, and so at a certain point, I shifted the way I was thinking about it. And I just, because I was getting really bad anxiety. I was putting on all this weight. I was getting high blood pressure. I had to go like get a blood pressure monitor because I was so stressed out. And then I was like, wait a minute. I, there, I, I, it's, does, there's no room for this kind of stress right now. There's plenty of other stuff to be stressed about. So I shifted what I was saying to myself, which was just like to let me see how much of this I can get done. Let me see how much I can get done. So it became more exploratory and, um, and the whole year and a half has just so much been about learning anyway. So I said, let me just keep myself in that learning space and let me just see, let me each day get up and see how much I can get done. And that completely changed the way that I was invested in it. And I really don't think that I would have even gotten as far as I got even halfway through um, if I had kept that uh, former mentality of like panic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that I realized I op I have been operating under since you know 1995 really ever since I started 
making work in the, in the world. And then, you know, before that in school. So uh, that it was a big deal. And now with everything starting back up again, it's like, wait, 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 wait. Like we, but we learned a lot, right? Like we're going to, isn't anything going to, we're not going to readjust at all for that. So um, that's the new space of navigation for me. It's like, oh no, like, come on, wait, wait, wait. But we learned so much. We found so much, didn't we? Yeah. So that's kind of where I am. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you for sharing. To our curators, you are curators, which are in a way also dramaturgs, or we talked about it yesterday with Bonnie Maranka and Katani, like you're like editors, you know, you put things together, you collage, you point with your finger two things to the text, you know, almost like in a synagogue or whatever, but um, but you don't touch it. Um, but how, what what is different now? What, has something changed or what are you thinking about at this moment when you are, as Jason, we don't really know, haven't really opened yet, but you will after a time of um, closure. Any one of you who wants to start? Alessandra, maybe. Sure, I can start. Um, I mean, for me at least, I wish I could say that things have slowed down. I think on the curatorial side, sort of curating, producing work, working with artists, it's been really complicated to be able to produce and present work safely, sort of with this other layer of administration um, around COVID protocols and making sure that it's safe for audiences and for performers. So just thinking through like rehearsals and um, tech and then the actual performance. So I think we've had to adapt new ways of working together, both within an institution with various departments and then also with artists. And I think the silver lining, at least for me, is that there's this real heightened sense of care and in my own curatorial practice, I really try to bring care and empathy into the work that I do. But I often have started finding myself um, opening conversations with artists saying like, how are you feeling? How can I support you? What do you need in this moment? And I think, you know, the past two years has been really rough for the cultural landscape and, and for artists. And so that's something that I've been trying to sort of um, do in my own curatorial practice, like enter everything sort of with care and empathy. And I think another great thing that has come out of the pandemic is that institutions right now, I think are looking a lot more towards collaboration. And that really excites me sort of pulling together resources, thinking about co-commissioning as part of the season, it, collaboration becoming really embedded in the future of programming, which is something um, that really excited me about this idea of chain curation, like a collective sort of coming together and bringing together different voices and artists. And um, sort of an example of that also is, you know, the shed we're hosting Bushwick Star for a month long residency in our spaces. And I think um, we have this commitment to collaborating with local organizations. And so, you know, it's something that I hope we continue and I hope to see it more across the field in general. Yeah. Um, Lumi? Um, I think I can take my mask off <laughs> as I talk. There was, there was a lot of, well, actually, no, never mind. <laughs> yeah. A lot of traffic in this office. So um, I would agree with Alessandra in terms of the, the kind of um, in this inability to slow down because there are just so many more things to think about now. Um, and I think that the um, kind of qualities of like the emotional labor that, you know, as curators, we always put into the work has really been forefronted during this process. And I think that's been um, really uh, a great, I mean, you know, it's been a learning process as, as well. So um, I think that like, this is a time when, you know, we all are very, hopefully just, just very generous with each other in a way that we couldn't feel previously, um, you know, because as Alex and Sybil and Isaac have all mentioned, you know, we were just rushing towards that next product, the next opening, you know, the next grant application, whatever. And, you know, I think just, um, having time to like understand where 
those kinds of limitations are within both within ourselves and within our institutions has been really crucial. And, you know, even like at the, you know, at the kitchen, we're doing like much less programming that we had done previously. Um, we are extending the periods where we worked with, you know, where we or how we work with artists in terms of kind of these like residency projects versus like, you know, just having artists in for a week or a night or, you know, all these things, um, all these different kind of timelines. So it's been, um, I think a really great moment where all these things have like coincided, but it also uh, <laughs> it pre still presents many, many challenges. So I think it's like, I don't know if there's gonna be a before and after to be totally honest. I think it's gonna be much more of like a, a, an up and down wave of like trying to, like I think it's civil to carry on these lessons that we've taken with us and then like, you know, just kind of checking ourselves through this, through this time being like, is this what we really need to do? Um, and like, you know, just as, as much as we all want um, that kind of like normalcy just to like really take some time to be like, what, like, why was that normal in the first place? Mm. Jay, how do you feel? How is it? Uh, well, as I mentioned earlier, so uh, Scribble is embedded in a much larger uh, institution and um, whose primary purpose is not Scribble. <laughs> so um, we, uh, the COVID, um, COVID tide, as I call it, was difficult for us. We, uh, NYU had us furlough 14 of the 18 staff members, which um, was truly one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. And um, then the remnant, uh, there were four of us total during COVID um, from January to roughly March, uh, trying to reinvent ourselves. Uh, we didn't jump on the um, um, that uh, wagon where people were streaming performances just because we didn't have the resources, but we did pivot to really increase our humanities offerings. So we were doing talks and things like that. And um, and then in May, uh, staff started to come back. Uh, but the um, protocols are such that we have not been able to open up through letters. We're doing things internally for NYU uh, because they can they can totally track daily the folks who are in the building like every day I get up I have to fill out something called the uh, I don't even know what it's called uh, but I have to show a pass every day that's dated uh, and all of that and we still don't know for sure that we're going to have a spring season I mean we, we have uh, planned it uh, and that was rather arduous because, uh, you know, most of the curators here had things lined up and then that all went away or did it just go on pause or did it re uh, so that so I wasn't really doing my curatorial role during COVID because I really had no agency. And I guess agency was taken away from a lot of us because we just didn't know what was going on and what we could do. But um, so I'm, we're hoping to open uh, in February uh, through May with uh, bringing seven different productions in or seven different um, shows. Uh, but like I said, it could all, it could just all, um, it could not happen. And I guess that's something we're all dealing with. I mean, if I learned anything in COVID is like I knew nothing. From day to day, from hour to hour, things change all the time. So um, it became kind of almost as that. Like I was in the moment and wanted to be elsewhere. Uh, but uh, it's also kind of, you know, the, the truth of the matter is too, um, COVID made me rethink the climate. And Scribble does a lot of international programming. So are we going to? continue to bring artists here uh it's it's a huge complex question uh I, and there's also not much touring for artists anymore in the united states 
especially international ones, unless you're somebody, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't know who really gets a lot of tours. The folks we bring in are really kind of um, not brand names who are going to then go have a seat in the United States. Tour. So, uh, so that's one thing I'm thinking about. The commissioning thing is easy for us, uh, and um, totally the co-commissioning thing. Uh, a lot of people have reached out to us to ask us if we want to participate. Commission artists, I'm like, I love cooperation. Uh, I think that's also why I like the chain curation idea is you're actually working with other people. So commissioning, the climate, uh, uh, realizing how much I actually cared for the staff here, especially when they were there. And um, also just not knowing, planning, hoping the way it happens, but not knowing if it would be done. Thank you, Jesse. How is that for you? Are you based uh, at Wayfield in the Bronx? Is your office then there? Is that um, well, you work from home? How, how do you experience the moment? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I work primarily on site, and we've been on site um, since July of 2020. So, because we um, have a large outdoor space, we were able to open up quite early. Um, and I think that has also influenced the way our programming team and our institution as a whole sort of sees itself and has responded. Um, and on a personal note, I know for me, and it sounds like for many of us, um, the beginnings of the pandemic were quite a rough landing, um, sort of being like torn from the comfort of familiarity. Um, and it was quite painful, um, but also opened up what I see as kind of a portal into another way of operating. Um, and I really used that moment for myself to like do some personal work, but also then extend that into my own curatorial practice where I dove really hard into accessibility online um, or thinking about sort of transparency with artists in the terms of timeline and sort of, I remember there were these opening emails we were all sending around, like, I hope you're safe. I hope you're well. I hope like everybody in your network and in your consciousness is also well. And I've noticed that that sentiment has been lost in some places, but also in one-on-one -on -one interactions with artists or curators who I um, encounter, we've really kind of been holding that still. Um, and I think that that giving space for that and sort of the fluxes of emotion that come when you ask those questions is partly why I was so interested in Isaac's work because Isaac was teasing out this yo-yoing that I think many of us have felt um, and been kind of articulating over the last um, year and a half. And right now I feel this intense tension between like the world I saw possible and then the integration into the world that is now and where that world wants to be going back in some places moving forward. Um, and so I'm trying to find the moments in my own small way where I can still um, amplify those ripples of what I want. And what that looks like for me is um, building out, and I think Lumi spoke to this, building out larger project timelines where I can start engaging with an artist earlier on and be able to give that space to go through whatever emotions they need to go through or being even more transparent in project timelines and sort of maybe institutional idiosyncrasies. Um, and I've found that that has been really helpful for me as someone who has to work between both an institution that I, I love and institutions that I love and have complicated relationships with and artists that I love that I want to have relationships with these institutions. Um, and so it's a lot of this sort of, I feel like I'm juggling balls that don't exist, right? These balls of emotion or psychic energy or things like that um, in the work in a way that I wasn't necessarily before. Hmm. Yeah, it is It is certainly a time of upheaval, of disruption, um, and maybe not just modification. Someone said, you know, inventor or some like Steve Jobs with the iPhone, he disrupted an industry and others then, the Google form that came adopted it. So the question is, what what moment are we in now? Is it a mixture of both? And I would like to ask you all, um, what do you all think? What do we really need now? What is urgent? What is meaningful? How should 
see the performance look like, uh, what should be presented, maybe examples you like, but, but also from you, what you feel, you know, what does this city need? People say states have the democracy they deserve. So perhaps say that, you know, countries or state have the theater they do, but what, what would work for New York City? What is important? What do you feel has to be done that might also or should be different? Anybody, it's open, open uh, mic. And well, go. Sorry. go. Oh, ahead. yeah, go ahead, Alex. Yeah, Alex. Alex. Um, yeah, I, I guess to return to some of the things that um, I was saying before, it's the question now is so enmeshed for me with um, economic needs and structural needs. So, like, for instance, I don't think that the in a place like New York City, the theater institutions can fully be responsible for offering what artists actually need to make work. And so there's kind of this like confusion of sorts where arts institutions um, are maybe expected to provide things that they actually can't because what artists need is cheaper rent. Um, and I think about that a lot in terms of the history of New York City um, and just the squeezing out of um, like spontaneity and possibility of long periods of experimentation that are really only possible when you have cheap space. Um, and so I've increasingly been thinking like what I want to advocate for as an artist is like commitment to the redistribution of space, not just for working, but for living. Because institutions, arts institutions can offer um, space for rehearsal, which is incredible and i think like all spaces should be open for rehearsal including like empty bank vestibules just taking up valuable real estate like i really mean that i think people should be able to have their dance rehearsals in these empty glass cubes you know but furthermore like we need places to live that are affordable and that make a different kind of thinking like slow deep complex thinking possible um and so it yeah just seeing new york city specifically kind of empty out as the rich people went to their estates um, and the business is closed. It was just sort of a this embodied sense of horror walking around. Like there, there is the space, there are the resources and that shouldn't be on arts institutions to provide. It should be really on governments um, and on how we think about resources and how we think about what we, what we deserve and the kind of horrifying iniquity of hoarding empty space. Um, so, so yeah, that's one thing I've been thinking through. I sort of feel like it would be nice to see the real estate industry like put some support into the arts more because the whole city has been gentrified to the point where like I had to move an hour and a half north just to be able to like live. And um, the artists are the ones that go into in, and, and start that process um, of, of, of pushing and then until they are until they are pushed out. And um, so that would be nice to see some, um, I don't know, similar like someone was saying at New Dramatist um, a couple of years ago, like uh, I think it was one of the guys from... Um, uh, Cornerstone Theater Company, how, and they're, they're LA based, how the television industry like goes in and harvests playwrights and then doesn't do anything to sort of return the favor or to plant seeds. And so I, th there's, you know, to kick artists out or to push artists out or to, um, uh, uh, offer so little support on the, on the business side, like not, I'm not even talking about art, arts institutions, but um, the other, uh, the other uh, industries that, that profit off of, off of arts and culture in, in New York and, and all cities. Uh, how about if they could start kicking in um, because artists need support. We need places to live and, um, and we need financial support more than more than it's not sustainable. And um, yeah, that was that in looking back to uh, pre pandemic times, it wasn't sustainable the way I was the way I was doing it. 
Um, so I don't know. I, I, I don't know what it's going to look like from here, but that, that would be so great to see um, so, some of the industries that, that profit so much off of um, artwork to, to really uh, give back in a way that's um, uh, not so much about policy or, or gatekeeping even, but just um, giving, giving support and um, not looking over, not looking over, just having faith that we're going to, we're going to know what to do with that support. I think about a middle ground between how that can happen. And I think it, I, I, I think about Ellen Baxter a lot. Have you, do you all know this name? She, um, was an activist in the 70s who started the Broadway Housing Committee and um, ended up suing the city of New York um, to kind of ban single room occupancy. And through that started and got funding from the city of New York to create affordable housing through this Broadway Housing Committee, which um, Sugar Hill is one of the projects part of this housing group. And I, 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 I come to this middle point between, I guess, Alex and Sybil here, because like, yes, the government needs to do it. No, I don't think the government or real estate will do it benevolent, whatever that word is, benevolently, right? I think there's a level of force that has to happen. And so I am starting to look at these strategies of where like lawsuits, crafty doings um, can maybe result in some middle form of policy that's not quite government that's not quite amorphous but something that does create a middle ground where these two spaces start to create some fruitful um change but that also took like 11 years with like ellen and like two volunteer lawyers who were suing a city and that has resulted in maybe like six housing complexes so i don't know where that gets scaled up, but I think those types of antagonisms with um, our, our policymakers and sort of the institutions at large kind of need to start start happening. Because I think, as Alex said, like institutions feel responsible or some falsely feel responsible to change it all when, when they can't. And I think that actually ends up um, watering down an institution's ability to do meaningful work because if they're spread so wide in one way, it limits the engagement or actual depth of um, contact in other other ways. Yeah, I I find that example you offer um, of Baxter really helpful. Like, work can operate in different spheres and different modes. Like, neither the arts institution nor the artist, I think, has to do it all, and it doesn't all have to go into the peace you know what i mean so to respond to your question frank in terms of like what kind of work we desire to see mm -hmm. it it's not like i necessarily need to see the activism around housing on stage although i would be delighted to but i'm not necessarily saying that i'm saying like i want to see the totally unbounded experimental joyous embodied deep complex, strange work that might emerge from the circumstances of having time and space to live. Um, so I don't even, I'm excited by the fact that I don't know what that could look like because we haven't had that circumstance in New York for several decades now. I'll jump in. Um, the type of work that I would like to see, <laughs> um, I've discovered this week, isn't really what other people want to see, which is doesn't really surprise me. And I'm talking specifically about um, like Tina Satter's show, uh, which is fabulous. I, I hope everyone here has seen. Well, Rumi certainly has, <laughs> um, but um, you know, it, it's closing. Uh, it's closing early. And I'm like, you know, the artist, by the way, she was at Prelude, you know, so a couple of times. Yeah. So, um, so I was thrilled when um, that show and Tina and all those wonderful actors got made it to Broadway. Um, and maybe they 
been running a month or something like that. And to read in the paper on Monday or whenever was heartbreaking to me that it was closing November 14th. So I was like, please, I, I, I hope those Tony voters get to see it because um, it really deserves to be seen, as does Dana H. I, I actually hadn't seen that until just last week. These are wonderful works, and they are from colleagues of ours in the downtown scene. And it's like, all right, well, Broadway doesn't want this. <laughs> I guess they want Jagged Little Pill or any of that stuff. And um, so, it, if anything, it makes me uh, want to even embrace work like that even more. The problem with Skirball is it's so large. You know, it's it's 800 seats. So, um, and I'm fine with reimagining the use of the space, but we, we can't make a home for everything because of the scale. But I somehow would love to get Scribble uh, involved more so in uh, sustaining experimental local work. Uh, so that, that's the type of work I would like to see. Maybe I'll just follow Jay since, um, yeah, that, you know, Tina's show premiered at the kitchen, which is 155 seats and a two week run. Um, and then went to the vineyard, which is like kind of similarly scaled theater off Broadway and then went to Broadway. And, you know, my, like, I was so like, made sure like everyone was so thrilled when, is this room made it to Broadway? And just thinking about just the like, you know, uh, the idea that like in one night at the at this Broadway theater, you know, the amount of people who were exposed to reality when our story was like the same as like the entire run at the kitchen. Um, but then, you know, of course, then you're exactly as Jay said, you're like butting up against like that, the idea of these different publics and like what these publics actually like want and desire and like, um, you know, thinking about like, you know, maybe this play could have run up the kitchen for like three months without any interruption um, and like just have a completely different uh, tension and, you know, um kind of like understanding of like what what is happening on stage but you know i think that like something that we've that's been really helpful here to kind of like you know help us understand like what i don't know i don't know if it's like what we want to see but like you know coupling what we want to see with like you know helping artists transition through this stage is just like this um this idea of like getting away from box office in general, you know, like this is the idea that we had um, free programming during COVID. We had uh, Sophia Cleary's show um, in September, which was just for one person at a time. Sophia did, um, I think, eight performances. So the total run was, you know, I mean, the total kind of like box office was like eight. <laughs> Um, but like without sacrificing like any of the kind of like theatrical um, aspects of the work or the production aspects of the work. Um, and then, you know, like now finding this uh, kind of um, balance with, you know, Alex's shows are 30 people in the gallery, which is half capacity. And like what, you know, what can we achieve through these like, you know, different types of audience experiences and, you know, uh, just kind of, again, like moving as, as thrilling as it is to have like a piece go to Broadway, like moving away from, you know, like all those um, things that define success in that, uh, in that traditional sense. Yeah. I can jump in here too. I've, Alex, I so appreciate what you said and have just been thinking about it um, for these past few minutes, just about this idea of se separating the artist from the work. And like, I think there's what the artist needs from the institution to be able to make the work. And then there's what an artist needs to be able to live and thrive in New York City. And that includes like housing, foods, that all of those 
things that sort of relate back to um, security. And I, I mean, for me, those issues are so vast and micro and I'm, I grapple with how to tackle that. I think working with an institution, it could sort of be done on a micro scale. And I think um, from the pandemic, like I'm okay with incremental change. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about changing infrastructure to like, you know, the artists that, that we work with, if someone is making work about climate change or climate emergency, like how can we also embody that within the institution? So like, what does a carbon neutral performance or exhibition look like? Do we really need to be building existing walls and spending money and creating all of this additional waste? Can we be working with local fabricators or performers? So I, I've been thinking, I think the, the work I wanna see needs to be reflected also back into the institution into our own practices. So like if an artist is making work about, you know, sustainability, like how can we take that inwards a bit more um, and I know that's quite quite broad, but I've just been trying to think about that with the future programming that we have and in my own curatorial practice. So really appreciate that you said that and, and shared that piece about artists versus the work and you know how that's reflected back. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and maybe one question, you're next to, um, of course, the difficulties, the financial, one the private here you of know, ways of living of existing or caring as someone said yesterday about my parents or grandparents you know as a as an artist they're real these are real issues you know how can you be even a supportive family member you know and you, if you have such a hard time even for yourself and it shouldn't be that way but the way the work we see um we often had also carol martin um, with us she you know, is uh, writes about that kind of the theater of the real, the uh, engagement with layers of reality, with um, you know, like um, Tina's work. You know, she collaged uh, the FBI files and put it together. And Bonnie Maranka yesterday, who was with us, says, "Well, perhaps I am now thinking about the theater of the imagination, um, something that goes away, actually, from the representation of what is real." Um, or seems to be real. What what do you all feel um, um, if you look around to your friends, colleagues? Will there be um, something emerging um, that um, that is is different? In East Berlin, they had tragedies in the time of Heiner Müller. He said, you know, tragedies are for dictatorships. Once the wall came down or opened up, he said, I'm, I'm not a comedy writer. I'm not really. So he stopped writing. You know, he said, I couldn't really adapt for it anymore. What do you think? What are we? What What do you pick up from your colleagues or friends? What do you feel is or will be important or audiences would like to see? Um, something that I've been thinking a lot about that I, I find in others' work that's really exciting to me is, and I think it's happening more and more after you know the past few years and this real uh, grappling with reality. Um, I like seeing work that has a sense of possibility that isn't uh, really connected to utopia. Um, and I think that that's maybe even controversial to say now. It was a very big, like, like especially like a very big queer locus for many years in the New York performance scene. Um, I'm of course thinking about Jose Munoz, who's a brilliant thinker. Um, but I think that, and you know, in other parts of his work, he, he also sort of touches on this, but I think that what is really the most interesting is when people are trying to rework the, the material that we have to live with, that are kind of contending with the things that we can escape, accepting that the systems are always going to be a burden on us, um, and not from a place of antagonism, but from a place of making, uh, like making do of, of coping with these things, of rewiring these things, um, and sort of like finding new ways of, of looking at them that don't get so far um, beyond the material or beyond this actual space that, that have a little bit more of a sense of grounding. And I think that can still be in abstraction. I think that can still be in really exciting kind of indulgent forms in a lot of ways. Um, but I think that what's most exciting is having some kind of um, almost like a sense of, of humility and thinking about these like big ideas. Like you can, like, I, I get the most impacted when something is 
like extremely poetic, but also is affecting and like relatable in some way where I have to take a moment to like kind of process the sadness that comes with it as well. Um, I have been noticing a lot of work being made with improvisation and pleasure as a guiding principle. And I'm really, um, yeah, delighted and uh, uh, curious about like sort of reading what that those trends in a way, like very recent. I mean, I'm talking in the past few months, I've just been like noticing people talking about their work that way. Like um, the improvisatory nature seems to me to be about a kind of inability in this moment to set things when things have been so tumultuous from one week and one month to the next. Like it, it actually seems illogical to set something that based on the experience of the past two years might have to be totally reworked. Um, and so it's almost like coming out of that, I see a lot of my peers and colleagues and people whose work I love like sort of offering, well, what we do have is like pleasure and delight in the body and that as the thing to be followed and welcomed and celebrated. And like when we are in shared physical space together, um, how like delicious and lush that is. Um, and so curiously, I've like not been seeing that much of like an impulse to sort of like deal with what we all went through slash are still going through, but rather like when we're in space together, um, how strange and how joyous and how odd that can be. And I'm like, I'm curious, I think, when we like pass through to somewhere, which may never happen, <laughs> there might actually be more space for processing. And we're so in the middle of like understanding ourselves and our bodies in relation to each other and each other's bodies and like breath and gaze and all these things that it's kind of like in that realm of just delight in having a, a body <laughs> or something. Um, so yeah, I'm really, really curious to see how, it feels very different for instance than like work during Trump, let's say. Or like it like I hear what you're all saying in terms of a kind of like imaginative desire, but reached through simply sharing space together. And I think I think with that, there's a messiness in a way that we're allowing um, artists and ourselves, where like the awkwardness of being in space is very messy all of a sudden. The breath of somebody next to you is leaky in a way that it wasn't. Um, before, and I think work, like I think of Godard as a filmmaker who um, didn't make films that had such a clean narrative arc. You were kind of just rolling with the sequence. And there was like also a messiness with that where you may not have known where you were going. And I am looking at artists and looking at work and especially live work that does that where it's confusing or it doesn't have such a clean bow. And I think that also um, can take the work outside of the realm of entertainment. Like I think so much of live work in the mainstream space um, is understood as live work for entertainment. Even music sometimes is looked at as entertainment or a backdrop. And so I'm interested when the mess or the that sort of openness can free work from that, that pressure of feeling like entertainment. And instead it's this, um, this active process of you kind of not even knowing where you're going or not knowing that it may end in this way you expect it or it may never end it can live on in you kind of after jesse everything you just said kind of describes sybil's piece <laughs> that uh, that i pick for for you know as my thing um about the messiness uh because it's incredibly messy, but not in a, uh, I don't know. I, I encourage you to, when, Sybil, when's your thing? Friday? Tomorrow, right? Okay. At seven. seven, yeah. seven We're seven, only yeah. showing a couple scenes, but you can, um, you can stream it from Abrams and see the whole thing after November 4th. But it's totally like, where is this going? Everything you just said, I was like, it's, it's so, I encourage you to to tune in because if that's the work you like, you'll you'll totally groove on. I will. I can't wait. It's a mess. What about you? Yeah. 
Um, well, you know, I, I really think about uh, geography right now. I think partly because I'm not living in the city anymore and it really, it's not that far away, but it's also a million miles away at the same time. And uh, well, we were making this piece that I'm going to be showing tomorrow night. Um, we had one performer in New Orleans. Our composer was in Austin. We had uh, performers from Brooklyn. I was up here. I had another performer across the river. So we were kind of uh, all over the place the whole time and we were able to do it thanks to the internet and just sort of put it, put it together. And man, we really use that internet. Um, and then I think about uh, when the lockdown first happened and I've been moving around sort of like squatting in different friends' houses the whole time. All my stuff is in storage. It's been a little bit insane. Um, and, and when the lockdown first happened, I was, I was uh, staying uh, in the empty home of a friend who lives even further upstate and um, on a hill. And, you know, there was, and I remember this about September 11th too, like how far is this going to go? you know, is everything going to shut down? Are we going down? Are we becoming extinct even? Um, and so I had this, uh, I had this moment where I was like, what if I have to do all the performance that I'm going to do, like on this road that goes up this hill where there's four residents on this road and one of them has a trump flag in their yard and another one is like i don't know what's going on with them but they're very troubled a very troubled couple and then then there's the aclu lawyers up the street and then the you know stock traders i guess you know what if what if these four people were my audience and i had to you know does that change my work what kind of what would my work look like um and I, I actually don't think it would change that much, weirdly, but uh, the way that I would do it would, would change. And so uh, I, I don't know if this question is, is like about the whole, the whole thing or just about our work individually, but I think the, um, like the, the subject matter of my work, I, I don't think would change very much, but the delivery system would have to change it. And that would be a, quite radical of a change and would, and would say a lot. Uh, about it, but it would definitely probably still be very messy. Um, and uh, yeah, but, but, but thinking about geography, spanning geography, and then like rooting down into one very small geography, either one or the other, it, it, it seems to me are, are the, are the possibilities that are um, compelling me at, at the moment. Yeah, I guess two things are coming to mind for me based on some things you said, Jesse and Sybil and Isaac, like um, geography, maybe in relation to utopia, which like famously means no place, nowhere, um, and how that like collision or contradiction feels like a place I want to be inside of as a world, like what is a world that is no world, which makes me think of apocalypse and like the apocalyptic moment or the sense of end times um, as a generative space to be in. So like uh, end of the world is possibility of worlds or possibility of something beyond world. Um, and uh, also Jesse, the mess, messiness, <laughs> um, which I really relate to and cherish and love in your work, Sybil, um, it makes me think of messianic, like the messiness inside a messianic impulse. Um, messianism as like, for me as a, as a Jew, <laughs> is like helpful way to frame like utopia in terms of a thing that will never come. Like Moshiach is that which will not come to save us. Um, yet we must continue doing everything we can to bring about his arrival, but he's not gonna come. <laughs> because then we'd be Christian, you know what I mean? Like devotion to the unarrival of the Messiah, even though all we want is his arrival. And so in like thinking about no place and utopia, 
I don't know that just like I was feeling these uh, this excitement hearing all of you talk like yes yes to to be in the place that is no place or to be desiring and moving towards a place that is not there and that is nowhere and and like embracing the the contradiction and how that feels and um that we're like never going to get there and we have to keep trying to get there and maybe there is like brief really brief moments and like sh shards mm. yeah it's very exciting to yeah, it's like a true contradiction. Like there's always, when you have a contradiction like that, you're always, it feels to me like there's always a lot of truth there, you know, and like we are devoted to what is impossible, you know, and that's always been true, but it really now, it seems to me like it's becoming like a mark, like real mark making. Like we have this moment, like we, we could be, I mean, it could be, it could still be over, you know, for us. So what are we, what are we going to do in the meantime? Like, what are we, um, uh, what are we here for in, in the mm. meantime? Alessandra and Lumi, both of you, what do you pick up as signals? You know, you have your ear close to the, to the landscape and, and what do we, what would you guys like to see? Um, I mean, I don't know. I actually don't know what I'd like to see, <laughs> but just like picking up, I mean, or just like continuing this conversation a little bit, you know, I, it just reminds me of a lot of conversations I had at like the beginning of the pandemic or I don't know, middle of the pandemic or you know, sometime when we thought there was, was going to be a very finite period, like that there was strict beginning and end. Um, and, you know, artists were like, I'm never going to make work about COVID or I never want to see work about COVID. Um, and I think that, like, I think we're all in a state now of, like, exactly what, what Alex was saying. Like, we're we're never going to arrive at this, like, end, <laughs> you know? So uh, that the impact of this moment is, like, felt through all these different ways and, and the work is never going to be like about COVID like it's never going to be like a narrative about the virus but it has deeply of course shaped everything that we've done all the approaches to everything that we do this idea of like you know not being able to fix anything because everything might change in the next you know 24 or 40 hours or um, whatnot so that like you know it's not just um, artists that are capable of kind of um, thinking like that, but like making sure that like our infrastructures around that are also kind of you know aligned with with that thinking. Yeah, that's that's a great response. I feel sort of um, similarly. I think a lot of the work being created right now is almost a continuation of conversations that were happening before the pandemic that are just like amplified. So again, it's not necessarily about COVID, but artists are like continuing these really important themes that they have been working through related to like race or equity or accessibility or sustainability, like these very heavy topics. So for me, it's been like a continuation or heightening of some of these ideas and Jesse, I love what you said too about sort of the messiness. And I think there's this embrace of not showing work also that's completely polished or finished. And I think it is really a testament to this moment that we're in, like taking the time to slow down and not being so precious about the work and who it's shown to. And I, I think I really appreciated that as a curator. Like, you know, I, I went to a performance this past Sunday as part of Performa and found myself on the beach at, at the Rockaways. And I think there's something beautiful about also taking work outside of the theatrical black box space and into this known civil, like what you were saying, into the natural environment and sort of leaning into this idea of chance and surroundings. And so that's something I've really appreciated um, over the past few months, just seeing work again and um, experiencing things outside of like the black box space. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, some some people do do refer to that time we're in as a kind of apocalyptic, but in a sense of the word, that means uh, unveiling. It didn't always mean disaster. It was actually the unveiling of a truth, like Apo is taking away and Calypso is like a 
you know, the taking away uh, um, of, of a shell or something. And that's what it did. It exposed real structures. We see how are people, how are institutions naked in a way. It's scary. I think Richard Schechner said it's like a nuclear reactor burst and we look inside it. We are on top um, um, of it. And and the big question, of course, is where where will it be going? And uh, yesterday, and Catania said, you know, um, theater people, performance people have been on the outside always. They are outsiders. Nobody wants them. Um, till a hundred years ago, they wouldn't get buried and married even in New York City. There's that little church, you know, on 29th Street. They were a lot nice to them. You know, they, she said, it's what we always have been. And perhaps we have to go back to apprenticeship systems like uh, companies. Artists will take people on. We have to say goodbye to the uh, uh, universities who charge you eighty thousand dollars, you know, you go into debt already when you start. How work? How can you do an experimental artist, you know, when you have uh, so much debt to to carry with you? So perhaps um, this naked truth, but she says, you know, Shakespeare's work was actually outside the city of London, next to bear fights and dog fights, and even now people say you teach Shakespeare. It's a microaggression. You know, in some universities, they say we can't teach it anymore. It's uh, incredible what is happening at this moment. Of, I mean, but the question is, will that be um, again that this outside status? Also, what Jay says, he li- feels a little bit at the university. You, as the artists, feel, and perhaps you know, also you as curators. Where the question is, where will we go? But what, what will be presented for a city to celebrate life, to experience life, to experience art? You know what? What will work? And there will be stuff shown. There will be uh, stuff done. And um, I, I think you all make a big um, a contribution. But do you think it will lead to kind of the Obamacare that people will be embracing the asthma? Or will it be more they say, no, you're the outcast, actually, and we don't care. You can you know, be in your um, uh, um, wagon and go through you know, and perform uh, in, in cities, which some people, I think, have done, you know. But how fun. I mean, what a beautiful image. Like, that's the lineage, you know. That's the what I feel like I come from as a performer is, like, being the outcast and traveling around in my wagon with my hand out, you know. And that's, like, the issues that I'm still grappling with. And, of course, like, the work of performance, uh, and I'm speaking now as a clown <laughs> primarily, is to, like, charm the audience or... Um, entertain them such that they are open to receiving ideas that they may have thought they were not open to. And so being an outcast is sort of the best way to sneak in because you're outside and you're able to observe (laughs) and you kind of have like the space and the chance to observe and to formulate your critique and to formulate your mockery, um, which is the classic tale of the Buffon, for instance, that I return to again and again, that the the people who were forced to live out in the swamp, well, great. So now they have lots of like time to hang out in the swamp and they can watch the elites of the kingdom at a safe distance and really like hone their their criticism of the way society is structured. And when they're invited in, it's kind of the job to, um, yeah, to entertain enough to get your food and your drink for dinner. Um, and and allow people to laugh instead of kill you. And then maybe after the performance is over, some of the ideas linger and linger and linger, and then uh, the king and everybody goes to bed, and, and, and right before they go to bed, they, kill, they all kill themselves <laughs> because suddenly like it hit them <laughs> what the Buffon was saying. Um, so, so yeah, I feel like that's actually maybe a, a more appealing model to me than supposed embrace, which actually functions as neutering or something like that, like a, a kind of couch being couched in, in resources and institutional embrace, um, which I'm like always slightly skeptical of because who's behind the money, you know, and, and why are they being so supportive? <laughs> it's always like, um, you know, this weekend I went to like an experimental clown party that it turned out was funded by Peter Thiel. So like, you know, he has reasons, right? People with money have their their reasons and i'm and i think that's important to have like a certain skepticism about the the you know, caring embrace um that it has mysterious <laughs> the, where, where the king is kind of hiding let's say i mean I'll, i can add to that alex and i'm gonna um, echo something that 
and a, a colleague who I met recently who is a legal representative and a member of the Shinnecock um, community on Long Island, um, they started their career working in cultural institutions and they've since sort of left and they're now really a, a lawyer and representing this community and suing the government and all of that stuff, but they still keep a foot in the door in all of these cultural institutions where they worked. And if you go to an event where they're at, they're always asking questions um, and it's because they realized and they told me that people come to art events and, and cultural organizations and while there's a lot of problems with them, this is one of their powers, is that they come disarmed and they come ready to almost listen to, to the artist, right? They're, they, they're willing to be fed whatever an artist will give them. And there's so much power in that vulnerability of an audience. Um, and I think, as you're saying, Alex, to continue to kind of really work that delicate space um, and sort of even expand on that and amplify that more intensely and more intensely so that at the end of the night, um, they're shook awake or shook to death is really, um, that's a goal, right? It's something I can certainly lead them to. Yeah. I know it's a, it's such a big it's such a big theme. We are coming also closer um, 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 to the end, and um, and I think uh, we're asking questions, and um, we should actually have better questions. We won't find answers, and that's what artists should do um, the, to ask questions, to disrupt, to create problems actually, and not solve them. I feel very strongly that this is a time, and perhaps it has to become a bit more militant with lawsuits. Perhaps lots of people talk about strikes. You know, the people should just say, no, this is not the way it works. We need to be paid. We shouldn't be just adjuncts. We shouldn't, you know, get tiny uh, honorariums. Meanwhile, leaders of big institutions, you know, uh, make it 30 times as much as someone on a low level in that same institution. That's wrong. Um, so we'll see um, where this all will be going. And I hope that our little festival uh, is a, a contribution towards it. Tonight we have... Um, um, at 4.30, I said, in the afternoon, the, the Indigenous Theater panel, and we listen to that community that's really overlooked, that said, uh, you know, uh, we often go out also on the Black Lives Matter and a lot of for everything. Very few come to our events, to our things. So the, and we were there before, also before slavery, and that shouldn't be compared, but, you know, there is um, um, an important um, to listen um, um, to it, of course, tonight. We have Alex tomorrow, Sybil. Um, tomorrow we will hear from the five at 12 noon of the five cities, you know, New Orleans, Austin, and, and Cincinnati, and Detroit, and Philadelphia. We are very proud that we were able to put that together here. How does it feel for them? And they are perhaps as close and as far as Sybil at the moment, you know, on the internet. And since we don't do live shows, we thought we invent, we bring them together to hear um, um, what they will be doing. And Friday is our open, small discussion you are thinking about to create in the summer of 2023, something like a citywide festival celebration in parks outside with existing institutions in all five boroughs. Who knows if it will work or not? I hope you can be part of it. But to seriously think, what, what does a city really need? What does it to listen um, to people from who are on the CUNY theaters, which are public theaters in the way, but they're underfunded and they don't get noticed. But how could they help the community, how can the cultural international institutions, the Goethe Institutes and the French and everybody in the Finnish, Norwegian, Italians, you know, bring in a global consciousness that is missing, um, as Jay uh, pointed out. Where will this be going all? And, um, and then also with some of our curators and uh, others to really think, how could that look like? We don't know if it's going to work. It's a, also an experiment. It might fail, but we think it's worth it and um but we can with little resources as with this festival i think we can ask questions i really really want to thank you all for uh, being with us and i know a panel with seven people is uh, some some people might even take it as an insult to even you know uh, participate but i think that spirit which also you all talked about alessandra and jay Lumi and others you know to collaborate to be together to listen to each other even if it's difficult and to hold that space of um antagonism of complications, things they will never be able to solve. Bertolt Brecht, the great writer said, you know, you should be able to think in um, controversies or things that cannot be resolved. Actually, if you think it's black and white, right and wrong, you are small minded, you know, you have to live in contradiction. You have to accept it. And like democracy, that's never there, but we have to go to it and we have to 
work for it. And the same is perhaps with this utopia. And I think art has to make a statement. I think it's really the art that can save a city, unite people, bring peoples together. The Columbine shooting, as someone said yesterday, that wouldn't have happened if the school district hadn't eliminated art uh, uh, education in the schools. They, whoever did it might have said, oh, there are films and things and other stuff outside my tiny universe. I don't have to kill myself and everybody. So um, I think this is the hope. It's a very dangerous time, I feel. It's also a time where perhaps you know the, the ghost of fascism appeared for the first time in America and the arts have to come out and have to do something. And you all are such great workers and agents of change. And uh, so as you have our highest respect and we really are very thankful that you participate. And uh, I hope you also feel that this festival is a celebration of you, your work as curators, as editors, as producers, as artists, singers, dancers, performers in whatever form, musicians. It is. So thank you all. And thanks to HowlRound. That is so fantastic that they host that. You know, it's nationally streamed. Uh, we had listeners from over 25 countries. People want to know what's going on in America. What are artists thinking in New York? What are curators thinking? So it's uh, stunning that we have such a big reach, which we normally couldn't do it in our space. We're open. And I would like to thank Andy Lerner and Tanvi Shah, who put this all together, Gurav and the Cactus Juice uh, a company in Mumbai who made this possible, it's incredible. Came off our 24 hour talk we did with Indian artists. So um, we are very thankful and, but it's also, we are very concerned. And um, this is all very serious what we talk about. This is a future of our lives, of the city. And I think art has to take a stand and you all do. And um, we have to investigate how we can do that in a meaningful way where we also include everybody and, uh, and and keep the community the environment everything in mind so thank you all sorry about my little preacher thing it's my last uh, talk after the threes tomorrow uh, jake will uh, put this together with the with the uh, companies he selected and i hope um to see you all again and we are trying to get together a prelude party it might take a week or two or three but i hope to see you all in person and we get a dj and celebrate and dance hopefully so thank you all goodbye and uh, uh, see you soon. And tonight I'm going to come and see Lumi and Alex. I can't wait. One of the few new things to see. Bye bye.